All right. I fixed the switch back there and put new lights in, so have the, the glow of God this morning. <laughs> I feel like Moses coming out with the Ten Commandments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have different lights for you, Jay. <laughs> Oh, uh, this morning we're in um, the book of Numbers, the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 11. It's found on page 150 in your pew Bibles. One fifty in your Verses 1, 2, and 3. It says this. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused, Then the fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So that place was called Taborah, because fire from the Lord had burned among them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, as we come to you this morning and look at your word, Father, I, I just pray that um, your Holy Spirit can minister to us. Lord, and uh, as, as Jay already said, as this week especially, we remember all the bountiful blessings you have given to us, Lord. Lord, I, I just pray that we would continue just to uh, give you thanks and praise for all that comes into our life, Lord. And I thank you for this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. So I'm um, taking a, a week away from the book of Colossians, and uh, I, I want to focus on a topic that I often have times that, that I struggle with, and that's, that's complaining. I'm just gonna turn off this minor. I hear this humming the whole time. <laughs> Drives me nuts sometimes, but <laughs> I'm not complaining about it. Um, <laughs> now, it, it, it's something, you know, complaining is something that, that I struggle with, and I think all of us struggle with at, at times. Um, however, at this time every year, I am quickly reminded of how much I really should be thankful for. Many of you know that my favorite holiday of the year is Christmas, right? Soon you're going to see me frantically running around, putting up every Christmas light and decoration that I can lay my hands on. <laughs> Actually, it's so bad that Amanda has banned me from going to any Christmas stores <laughs> or even... The Christmas section, like in Walmart, is this beautiful section that comes and you come in and see the blow-up things and all the lights, and she just steers me away from that section. Because if I go in there, what happens is I usually start grabbing everything that I don't have, and I tell her, listen, every serious Christmas decorator needs to have this stuff. She doesn't buy it, though. So, so this Thursday is, is Thanksgiving, and it marks the beginning of the Christmas rush. Now, Thanksgiving, that's probably my, my second most favorite holiday, mainly because there is no gift giving or buying. Uh, but instead, there is a whole lot of eating of food, hanging out with friends and family, and then my favorite part where I don't feel guilty, just watching football all day. That's just, now there's three games. Oh my goodness, it's amazing. Yeah, you see, there's some, some guys understand. <laughs> But, but Christmas, Christmas has an ugly side to it that Thanksgiving does not have. It's a side that shows how, how ugly and how greedy our society really is. There's a meme that goes around on Facebook each year, and it reads this. Black Friday, when people trample others for cheap goods mere hours after being thankful for what they already have. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. All of you know that. So in, uh, recently, uh, just probably about a month back, in, in an effort to curb the complaining in, in our household and change our focus, um, Amanda started a, a gift list. And it's, it's a thousand, thousand gift lists. We're trying to put a thousand things that we are thankful for. Now, I, I won't lie. I, I laughed a bit when I saw it. And there, there, I was thinking, there is no way that we can easily do this. But it, it's a great idea. And Amanda, being the, the teacher organizer that she is, she decided to give each of us a different color marker 
to write down uh, what we're thankful for. Um, mine is, is red. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's not much there. But I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working on it, though. The, 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 kids, the kids have written down a lot. But, uh, I, and I have written down more since I've taken this picture, uh, mainly because of the sermon. But, <laughs> but the kids, they're always writing down some, some amazing things. And I love reading them, right? Uh, and things that I wouldn't even think of. They, they encourage me, what the things I read, and, and they make me laugh. And they remind me that instead of complaining, that I need to be thankful for everything. Now, thanksgiving, those two words, thanksgiving and complaining. These words contrast, are two contrasting attitudes found in God's children in regard to his dealings with them. Now, I read somewhere this saying by author Hannah, Hannah Whittle-Smith. She says this, the soul that gives thanks can find comfort in everything. The soul that complains can find comfort in nothing. Now, complaining comes in many different forms and phrases, such as, but not limited to, griping, grumbling, whining, belly aching. We've seen that a lot this last week. In, in the King James, the common term used was murmuring. That didn't really make much sense to me reading it, but now that I, I know what it means, murmuring is actually used a lot through the Pentateuch, through the first five books of the Bible. Regardless of the words that we use to describe it, complaining always has the same symptoms. The, de de the definary, uh, uh, dictionary definition uh, it describes it as an expression of unhappiness, dissatisfaction, or discontent. So complaining is the outward expression of discontent from within, right? We're, we're showing others, we're telling others what we are upset about. Complaining seems to have become the great American pastime, right? We live in a very complaining society. We're never satisfied. People gripe about anything and everything. Couples get together for an evening of fellowship, and the next thing you know, someone is complaining about someone or something, Employees complain about the company for which they work. Students complain about teachers and their workloads. Spouses complain about each other. Some generations complain about other generations. We might complain about styles of music. The complaining list goes on and on. Complaining just seems to be a normal procedure every day. As a matter of fact, complaining is so common these days that it could be called a way of life for many people. Just about everybody complains. And why not, right? There is so much to complain about. Traffic, taxes, our government. There's troubles of many kinds out there. But the commonness of complaining in our society does not make it right. The word of God comes down pretty hard on the sin of complaining. And that's what it is. It is a sin. Complaining seems to be part of our culture, right? If you watch any news, you will usually hear complaining. Or, more likely, as you watch it, you will start complaining. <laughs> but complaining is nothing new. It, it was here soon after the first sin was committed, right? When Adam compounded his mistake of eating that fruit, and then he said to God, oh, that woman you put here with me, she gave me that fruit to eat. God is probably thinking, you didn't complain about her when I first made her. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> it could be said that complaining is one of the most prevalent sins among Christians today. And because I believe we are all guilty of it. Now, to clarify, when I say I'm complaining, I'm not talking about raising awareness to others about something that is absolutely wrong, something that is sin. But instead, complaining is ra raising awareness to others about something that is neither wrong or sin, but instead it's a personal preference. Or maybe you're blame placing, right, and not taking responsibility for something. That's what, when it becomes sin. All complaining of this sort is against God and his providential will for your life. 
To murmur, to grumble, to complain against God is a sin, and we must see it just as that. I believe it would do us well to look at the past, this passage more in his background. Okay, so at this point in the story, God had greatly blessed his people by delivering them from Egypt. They were held captive for hundreds of years. They were slaves there, right? And he's protecting them against their enemies and even miraculously supplying them with food and water for them in the desert as they're making their journey to the promised land. Still, they complained. They complained about their food. They complained about how much better they had supposedly had it in Egypt when they were slaves. Now, how often do Christians do that? Where we forget that Jesus Christ has freed us from the bondages and the slavery of sin, and we complain about our circumstances. Oh, I had it better back then when I could kind of do what I want and not feel guilty. And we forget we were slaves. It's what Israel was doing here. It says in verse 1 that the fire of the Lord burned the outskirts of the camp because he was so angered at their complaining. But did that stop the complaining? Nope. They then complained that they wanted meat to eat, right? No, not that they were hungry and, and had no food. No, they just were not satisfied with the Lord's provision, and so they complained against it. And if you keep reading through the story, you quickly get the picture that God hates complaining. If you're not doing a devotional now or you want a, a book to read, read through the book of Numbers. It's, it is a, a great book that shows God's providence and, and God's will and, and, and how he carries us through in the midst of trials. But let, let me give you this morning three reasons why God detests complaining. Reason one, complaining speaks against God's sovereignty. See, the Israelites' success in entering the promised land depended on the sovereignty of God. So when they murmured and complained, they were calling into question God's ability to carry out his will. Complaining, of course, is just the surface symptom of a much deeper problem. And that deeper problem is discontentment. You're not content with what the Lord has given to you. This is why the Bible so strongly condemns complaining. The murmuring, the grumblings of complaint are evidence that we are dissatisfied with the way God is doing things. The solution to the problem is to recognize our sin and then realize and acknowledge that our Heavenly Father always, He always knows what is best for us. Even down to the little problems He allows us to face. In 2006, I led a trip of adults and a teenager to Thailand. It was a few weeks. And here we have, it's when we first got there, we stayed in really nice places. It was like a vacation. We had really nice bathrooms. We could, there's a menu, we're actually at McDonald's, but we ate at other places as well that had really good food. And it was just this great missionary trip so far. It was wonderful. Now, we knew we were going to hit some harshness because we prepared for them because uh, the second week we were going to be going out to a village and building a, a well um, or, or, or a clean filter, a water filtration system is what we're going to be doing from a, a stream and have it come down and have it be filtered and building this for this camp. So this first week, this is the view we're getting. No complaints. Everything's fine. It's just like back home, just, you know, just people look a little different, different language, but if things are cheaper, hey, that's even better. Not a big deal. Then the next week comes, and our accommodations change, and we're sleeping in huts. That's uh, two rough pieces of wood. That's our bathroom. <laughs> Didn't figure out how to use it for a few days. But um, <laughs> complaining quickly set in. And that, that food at the bottom, and well, that looks great. We had that for every meal every day. Five in the morning, noon, night, that was it. And it was better than the villagers ate. 
Yet, there was people on the team that complained. Some even complained, hey, we don't get you know, fresh water bottles every day. What's with that? I was like, oh, what did I do? But it, it, it showed us, though, that our environment controlled our complaining. When things were going well, it was fine. We gave thanks to God. Things quickly changed. The complaining set in. So what are, what are we basing our complaining on, right? What are we thankful for? Is God still providing? We still got a place to sleep. We got a place to use the bathroom. We still got food to eat. No right to complain. All of God's promises are still being met. Yet, we complained. See, one big problem with our complaining is that it focuses on what's frustrating us, and it forgets about the big picture. The big picture on that trip was we were there to help people that live like that every day. And as a side note, these are some of the happiest people I ever met in my life. And you, you know why we were building a water filtration system for them? Because European tourists would take tours on elephants through their villages and defecate in their streams. And they treated the villagers like they were a museum. We, were, we witnessed it with our own eyes. These, these French tourists came through on, on elephants. They were going through the huts. And we said, what are you doing? These are people's homes. They said, well, what are you doing here? I said, we're helping them. <laughs> so we, ha we had to build a water filtration system a mile away just for them to get clean water. But did the people in the village complain about it? No, not at all. They were happy that we were there to help them with it. Really put things in perspective for all of us. But we, we soon forget the big picture of things. We concentrate on the little things. That's where our frustration, our complaint comes from. And Numbers 11 went, went on to complain about their wilderness diet. They went on to talk about what great food they had in Egypt, just like we had better food outside the village. They forgot they were slaves there, though. They forgot that they were now off to the promised land, the land that God had promised them. See, when we get nearsighted and just look at the irritations and frustrations in front of us, we lose our perspective. We blow today's problems way out of proportion, and we forget the larger picture of the great things that God is doing in our lives. And complaining can be unbelief in God's word, which says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. See, if we really believe that the Lord is in control of our life and is working together all things together for, for good, then we probably should stop complaining and instead start thanking God for the plan he is working together for us. We put our trust and hope and faith in God and he sees the big picture and he knows what he's doing. Do you complain? And don't be too quick to answer this one. Think about it for a minute. What are your comments about the weather usually like? How do you speak about your spouse? What kind of things do you say about your job? Do you complain about when someone who didn't treat you the way you thought you should be treated? They didn't treat you right? Maybe someone cut you off in traffic. <laughs> I'm from Jersey, I understand. <laughs> now, examine yourself in this. Are, are you truly content with what the Lord determines for you? Now, while you're thinking about it, I, I have a, a, a short story about a time that I thought I had every right to complain. A couple years back, I, I went to the Philippines to help them out with their typhoon relief. It was for three weeks I was there, and I knew it would live it rough. It's fine. On the way home, however, taking, making my journey home, and I get stuck in Detroit Airport. One night goes by. <coughs> okay, next flight tomorrow. That's fine. That flight gets canceled. Okay. <laughs> and then they say, oh, you can't fly out of here. This is Friday. You can't fly out of here until Monday. What? <laughs> the person at the end of that phone call 
probably didn't have a good day after that. But <laughs> I got my new flight. But I thought I had every right to complain about the situation. I did not. God put me there for a reason. I don't know why. I might have wasted that reason. Maybe I was to minister to somebody. And I was so focused on myself, my own needs, that I wasn't looking for that opportunity. Right? That complaining twisted everything that I had done on that trip. And I was just happy to eventually get home. So complaining can really skew your view of what is happening around you. And complaining, remember, is, is a symptom of a problem. What problem? This is the problem I had then. The failure to trust God and submit to his providential will. God sees complaining as a serious problem. So much so that when the Israelites did it so much, his anger burned and he sent a swift punishment. If you go to the next chapter, Numbers chapter 12, Aaron and Miriam complained they complained to Moses, right? Well, God then struck Miriam with leprosy for seven days. I am so thankful for God's grace and mercy every day towards me because he knows that every day I slip up in this area. If you see me come in with leprosy one day, you know what happened. <laughs> Secondly, Complaining disrupts Christian unity. Turn, turn with me a few chapters ahead to Numbers chapter 13. I'm going to read verses 30 to 32. Now, the Israelites had finally made it to the gates of the land promised to them by God himself, the God who has been with them each and every day in a very real way, right? He was, it was a pillar of, of, of smoke during the day and a pillar of fire at night. He spoke to Moses directly. There was a, a, the, the tent of meeting, and God would actually meet Moses in there and talk to him. So it, it was a very real, tangible way that God was there. And God has carried him through many things, right, through, through going through uh, the, the Red Sea, crossing that, uh, providing for them. Now, so keep that in mind. And so, so, so they, they finally make it to the promised land. And before they go into the land, Moses, at the command of God, sends in 12 men. And they're, they're supposed to explore. They're kind of, they call them spies in the Bible, but they're, they're more like explorers of this land. And each man, man was, was chosen from a different tribe of Israel. So all 12 tribes sent one man. And they were to come back with a report. So the men have returned and this is the end of that report, starting at, at verse 30. It says this, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All people we see there are of great size. Now, of course, when the Israelites heard the report of the other 11 explorers, they began to cry and complain too. Now, what these 11 doubtful spies or explorers were in effect saying, they were saying, we can't do what God has told us to do. It's too hard. The people are too big. Now, would you say that it's just a bit of an exaggeration? Especially if you know all what these people had already gone through, what God has carried them through, they still doubt him? Now, have you ever done that? Have you ever exaggerated your problems and ignored what God has conquered for you already? God, you can't, can't possibly mean that I go there and do this. That would just be so uncomfortable. I don't know if, if my finances can handle me giving to them. I can't possibly leave the country. It's so unstable out there. You can't possibly want me to go overseas and do something. God says, 
I'm in control. I carry you through all this other stuff in your life. What makes you think I won't carry you through this? Now, let's see how this report affected all the people. Turn with me one more chapter ahead to, to chapter 14. In verse 36. It says, so then Moses had sent to explore, um, so the, the men Moses had sent to explore the land who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it. These men responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. Wow. That is some pretty serious stuff. These guys basically were spreading these, these lies. They were, they were, they thought they were giving maybe even an honest report. They're letting their fear control them. They were punished by God, and they were struck down because they caused everybody to have disbelief because of their complaining. See, the, the spies started the complaining and, and doubting, and the whole nation picked it up. The sin of complaining is contagious, and it spreads like wildfire. See, I, I used to think when I would talk to somebody and try to empathize with them, that most who complain, complain because they have a lot of problems. However, I have come to realize that most have a lot of problems because they complain. <laughs> See, complaining doesn't change anything or make situations better. It just amplifies the frustration and it spreads the discontent and it spreads the discord among his people. That is all complaining does. Thirdly, third point this morning, why God hates complaining. Complaining takes away from our Christian testimony. Amanda, a few years back, as, as her first effort to curb our complaining, she put a verse on our fridge, and it's a constant reminder to her and I about being thankful and pleasant. It's Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, do everything without complaining or arguing. If I just practiced that one verse in the Bible, I would have a lifelong journey. This is a great verse to remember, but the next verse gives us the why. Go to verse 15. It says, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. If we don't live in a crooked, depraved generation, I don't know what, when one is, if not now. Shine like stars in the universe. How awesome is that? In other words, this is the very reason why we are to do all the things, all things without complaining, so that you will be blameless, you will be harmless, above reproach, child of God. You are called to be all that a child of God is to be. A Christian who is always grumbling and complaining is harmful to the cause of Christ. Nobody likes to be around people who are always grumbling and complaining, right? Oh, here comes negative Nancy. What's she going to complain about today? Or what's he going to talk about today? Maybe just walk away. All right. It just, just it, you feel dirty usually. The world is not attracted to such a person. See, we, we often fall apart in the midst of trials and, and the world says to us, where is their God? Now, I re remember Paul and Silas. They were, in, they were locked up in, in the Philippian jail in, in, in Philippi. And, and, uh, and they were there because Paul cast out a demon from this girl that was following them, right? This demon possessed girl was saying, you know, here are two men of God and he cast them out, well, these two men, these other two men didn't like it. They were making money off this girl. So they, they, were, they were in this jail now. Now, what if while they were in the jail, if instead of praising God, they decided to complain and, and, and murmur, right? Or maybe they decided to, hey, I want my phone call. I want to call my lawyer to fight for my rights. No. What, 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 what if Paul, what if Silas would have said this to Paul? Paul, you big shot, you had a... You had to show off and cast a demon out of that girl, didn't you? Now look at the trouble we're in. Why couldn't he have just left her alone? Now, if that was a dialogue that went on between Paul and Silas, 
Do you think the jailer would have asked, what must I do to be saved? I don't think so. He probably would have completely been turned off by them in Christianity or maybe just saw them as just a couple of troublemakers like the others that are in jail. See, our testimonies are important. God uses our lives to influence others, to draw others to him through the power of the Holy Spirit. She, each of us has been blessed in many ways. The more we think about how we have been blessed, the more we will be thankful. A.W. Tozer said, among those sins most exquisitely fitted to injure the soul and destroy the testimony, few can equal the sin of complaining. Complainers are missionaries of misery. <laughs> Complaining always, always hurts those around us. Christians should not be complainers. The Bible is clear that complaining is repulsive to our Heavenly Father and a serious sin. Uh, Thanksgiving is a good time to remind ourselves of how serious of a sin complaining is. Most of us tend to blow it off as a small thing if, if we notice it at all, right? If, if someone is a drunk, maybe they have foul language or maybe they have a, a sexual sin of sorts, we tell them that, that that's a sin and that they need to stop doing it. But somehow when it comes to the sin of complaining, we rationalize it and we excuse it away. But in God's eyes, it is a vile sin. I have a short story here to, to show the differences between complaining and being grateful. Two boys were eating some grapes. One of them remarked, aren't they sweet? I guess so, the other replied, but they are full of seeds. Wandering into a garden, the first boy exclaimed, look at those big, beautiful red roses. The other commented, they are full of thorns. It was a warm day, so they stopped at the store for a soft drink. After several swallows, the second boy complained, my bottle's half empty already. To which the first quickly replied, mine's still half full. Many believers are like the negative thinking boy in this story. They always look at life through dark glasses. Like the children of Israel in today's scripture, they complain and grumble when they should be praising the Lord for his gracious provisions. The next time you find yourself complaining, remember the three reasons God detests complaining. Complaining speaks against God's sovereignty. Complaining disrupts Christian unity. And complaining takes away from our Christian testimony. Praising God is the best deterrent I know for complaining. Believers who keep praising the Lord usually achieve the victory over complaining. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, as your scripture reminded us this morning, we are to be always thankful for you and your provisions to us. Even when we don't see the full picture, I pray that you would give us strength, Lord. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit to trust in you, to put our full faith and hope in you, Lord, knowing that you are in control, that you work together all things for good for those that are called according to your purpose. Lord, and I, I pray that we will continue to realign our lives with your purpose and, our, and your will. And Lord, as, as we go about this week and as we celebrate um, Thanksgiving, Lord, I know many of us have things that seem that we should not be thankful for and maybe complain about. But I, I pray that we will instead focus on all the good we have and that we can spread that love to others, starting with the love of Jesus Christ. And I pray all this in your holy and precious name. Amen.